Assalamualaikum, selamat pagi, selamat sejahtera. So let's continue, still on the starchy subject, <laughs> starch, okay, for the next uh, few more lectures. Um, before we st start to discuss about the functional properties of starch, the first one would be gelatinization, the next one would be retrogradation. These are the two important functional properties of starch. But before that, we have to understand about the starch itself. In the previous lecture, we have learned about the chemical composition of starch. We learned starch basically consists of two molecular constituents called amylose and amylopectin. And I've seen, um, I think, Pek Hun discuss, uh, ask about or discuss about the differences between amylose and amylopectin in terms of solubility. Yeah? Please remember, when you talk about amylose and amylopectin, in the granule, in the native granule, they are always together. Always together. Not as a separate entity. They are always intermingled together together in a granule. They don't separate. We, we cannot think them as a separate entity. They are always together in a granule. But when we cook the starch, we heat up the starch, the starch granule will swell. I hope you all, all of you have seen the video. That's the best video I have found so far to show the real in real time the starch when you increase the temperature, swell slowly and slowly, just like when you blow the balloon, it will swell, swell, and finally psh, burst. Uh, actually, we can do that experiment. We can do our own, actually, the same experiment, but we don't have that kind of microscope. We need a microscope, just like normal microscope, with a so-called hot stitch, meaning, meaning that we, we put the, the starch on the slide, then we have some mechanism to heat up. It's slide, so we will. We don't have that kind of microscope. So these people have. This are, this is a group actually in Guelph, University of Guelph, Canada. So we can take the video and. But they are very generous enough to share with us. So that's when we talk about gelatinization. Later, I don't have to say much because that's basically what gelatinization is. But initially, they are in a native form. In a native form, they don't, uh, the, the starch granules are not soluble. They are not soluble in cold water or in, uh, at room temperature. What if, what if we leave the starch solution without heating at room temperature? We just leave, say, for one hour, two hours, a few hours. Do you think the granule will swell? Huh? No heating, no heating, no temperature. Just a ambient room temperature. L leave it for 10 hours. Do you think the granule will swell? No at all. Or a little bit. It will swell a little bit. Around maybe 20 to 28% of its original volume. It will swell, but a little bit. But if you increase, start to increase temperature during cooking, it will start to swell faster. Okay. So remember, amylose and amylopectin in the native granule, they are always together. The amylose content um, and amylopectin, different starch would contain different amount, different ratio. So uh, on average, normally, uh, the normal starch, we call it for normal starch, kanji biasa, normal starch, contain around 18 to 27 or maybe 30 percent or maybe as much as 33, 34 percent. So between that, between this range, 18 to 28 or even 30, 33 percent, 34 percent, what we call them normal starch. So what is normal starch? It contains around that much amylose. 18 to 27, or let's make it 30 lah. Eh? 
So we have normal starch, and we have also another group of starch called waxy. Oh, sorry. Uh, the normal starch also is known as non-waxy starch. Then another group is waxy. Also, uh, in, in Bahasa, we call it kanji berlilin. So waxy starch, uh, the most common one that we can see uh, in the market is the glutinous rice, pulut. So pulut, when you cook pulut, you know, it looks like very sticky, right? Uh, just like Japanese uh, rice, also very sticky. And usually the, 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 the sticky kind of uh, starch contain more amylo pectin. And they, also know, they are also known as waxy. Uh, the reason why they, they are known as waxy, because if you look at the grain, uh, some of the high amylo pectin, uh, some of the cereal, contain high amount of amylopectin. Uh, when you look at the grain, it looks like translucent, looks like wax, looks like lilin. Okay, that's why they are called fungi berlilin. And they contain very high amount of amylopectin, more than 99%. Uh, and there are not many types of waxy starch. We have, we have a con a waxy corn, we have waxy rice, but um, more recently, through genetic engineering or even through normal hy hybridization, uh, we start to have like wheat, uh, waxy wheat, we start even to have waxy potato. So, originally, there is no waxy potato, there is no waxy wheat, but through Genetic engineering. Now we we have also waxy wheat, waxy potato, and perhaps waxy other type of starch also can be made waxy like cassava. We don't have waxy cassava, but who knows? Uh, someday maybe you know through engine, genetic engineering we can also have waxy cassava. And the opposite of waxy is high amylose. So we have high amylopectin, which is waxy starch, and high amylose starch. High amylose starch, or sometimes also known as amylo starch. So if we have corn, amylo, uh, we, don't, we don't call amylo corn, but we call it amylo mains. So something that starts with amylo or amylo means that it contains high amount of amylose. And it can be between 50 to 90 percent. Um, you know, mung bean, mung bean, kacang hijau. Yeah, uh, mung bean, peas, kacang pi. Uh, those contain quite high amount of amylose, maybe around 40 percent, 50 percent, maybe. Uh, but the common type of high amylose starch is corn, high amylose corn. Yeah? And you will see later, the different amount of ratio between amylose and amylopectin really um, will influence the properties of the starch in terms of the swelling property, in terms of the gelatinization property, in terms of the retrogradation property, in terms of the texture is related to the amount of amylose and amylopectin. Okay. So we can see here, these are the various types of uh, starches. Potato, uh, uh, where, uh, corn or maize, wheat, cassava or tapioca, waxy maize, High amylose corn or maize and our sagu. When we say sagu, our sagu. <laughs> okay. So potato is ubi. Tuber. Okay. Um, jagong is cereal, bijirin. Gandum also bijirin. Ubi kayu. Ubi kayu, when we look at ubi kayu, we 
maybe we can say it is also a tuber. But uh, from the botanical uh, nomenclature, they are classified as root, not tuber. Yeah? Uh, maize, and so on. And look at the amylose content. And this average. If you read different books, maybe you will see different values, maybe different article, but they, these are average. Okay? So uh, potato around 20. Okay? Uh, cassava or tapioca, maybe around 17 to 19 percent, or maybe sometimes 20 percent. Uh, sago, 26 on average, but can be as high as what, 30, 34 percent. Okay, so these are average. Eh? Amylos, uh, amylos, high amylos. So the, the uh, high uh, the content of amylos is what ninety to fifty to ninety percent, and amylo uh, amylo no uh, waxy amylos content is less than one percent. So about ninety nine percent is amylopectin. Now, just now I said the amount of amylose and amylopectin would affect or would influence the properties, the functional properties of starch. But there are other factors. So now another factor is actually the granule itself. The shape of the granule. Um, so if you look under light microscope, see this under light microscope, maybe the magnification around 40 to 100 magnification. So this is how it looks like. If you look under even a bigger magnification under SEM, scanning electron microscope, it will look like this. If you look under polarized microscope, it will look like this. Okay? So, uh, I don't know, in your biochemistry lab or chemist food chemistry lab, I, there should be one experiment where you look the starch under the microscope. I don't, know, I don't teach the subject anymore. But by right, there should be one experiment where you look at the starch under microscope. No? Hmm. I don't know. Nowadays, so many different experiments have been cut. But anyway, that, this is how it looks like. Very simple. We just take one drop of starch suspension, put on the slide, and look under the microscope. You can see the starch granule. Very easy. Um, <coughs> And what, what can we say from these pictures? What can we say about the shape of the granule? Obviously, they are not the same shape. They, they, have, they have different shape, yeah. even different size. So we can see um, the from hmm. this one is sago, okay. and this one is rice. Is it? No, this one is tapioca. This one is rice. This one should be sago also. So you can see uh, in, in, in this sago uh, granules, the population of the granule, we have a round one, we have maybe not so round. We have one on one end here, this uh, sort of, this part is cut, cut off. So this type of granule is called truncated, truncated, tercantas, you know, truncated granule. So we have very small granule, we have bigger granule. So they have different, they have a distribution of granule size, very big, very small on an average. And when we look under polarized microscope, we can see the cross. So this is called Maltese cross. The Maltese cross, the Maltese cross is due to the biofringence of the because of the crystalline semi-crystalline structure exists in the granule. So that's why we can see the this cross, which means that the starch granule is a semi-crystalline has a semi-crystalline structure. If it's 100 percent amorphous, we won't see that Maltese cross. Okay, 
when we cook the starch until all the starch granule gelatinize the multi cross the multi cross would disappear we don't see the multi cross anymore so this is one way to show or to monitor the process of gelatinization native granule we will see the multi cross very clearly when we increase the temperature and the starch granule start to uh, swell the multi cross would start to fade Makin lama, makin hilang, makin lama, you know, makin sampai hilang terus, meaning that the starch has undergo a complete gelatinization. So that is one way to tell whether the starch is partially cooked or partially gelatinized or completely gelatinized. Looking at the microscope. But there are other ways of telling whether the starch has been gelatinized or cooked completely. But this is one simple way of monitoring the process of gelatinization. Um, so we can see the starch granule has different sizes, small, big. So what happens when the starch is, when we, when we cook the starch, we increase the temperature. Of course, the bigger granule and the smaller granule will swell at different rates. Okay. So that is why later when we learn more about gelatinization, we, we will see that um, we will see that the increase in viscosity of the starch will happen, will occur actually gradually. You know? So it won't, it, the, the viscosity will increase slowly, slowly until to the maximum. The reason because the starch granule, they have different sizes, they will swell at different rates. So they will increase the viscosity also uh, gradually. And under, the, my, under a, a bigger magnification, under scanning electron microscope, we can see some type of starch. They, the granule exists in the form of clusters. They stick to each other. They don't, you know, they don't, um, they don't exist in a free individual granule. They stick to each other. And this is also one way to tell the type of starch. Yeah? So this rice starch, uh, cassava or tapioca starch also sometimes form a clusters like that. And we can see uh, for, for this one, the cassava starch, we have a truncated granule, so this is a three-dimensional, uh, three-dimensional picture. We can see this truncated. In two-dimensional, we can see in this form. Some very round, spherical shape, look like a very smooth surface. Yeah, but when we zoom in into a single granule, some granules still look smooth. Some granules have actually not. A rough surface. Some granules even have small, small, tiny holes, pores. Okay. Um, rice starch. Can you see the difference between the shape of the granule or the the the, the appearance of the granule compared to cassava? In what way? In what way they are different? They have segi segi, kan? They are polygonal. They have many, you know, uh, sides. So they, they have a polygonal shape. And, and then and they can still form clusters. So this one cluster, the shape of the granule. So they have different sizes depending on the source. And the shape of the granule, bulat, lonjong, polygonal, truncated, have a smooth surface. And the size can range from 1 to 100 microns as small as 1 micron, as big as 100 micron. Potato granule, potato, is one of the starch which have a very big granule. Yeah? Up to 100. Rice have a small granule, 1 micron. Why do you think, uh, well, from your reading, rice starch can be used as a fat, fat replacer, right? As a fat replacer. Meaning that some food, we remove the fat, right? To make it uh, low fat, 
and how when you remove the fat you remove the functional properties of fat fat will give the nice mouth feel creamy mouth feel right and also carry the flavor the fat soluble flavor everything so that's why anything that contain fat like ice cream like those you know always you know very flavorful kan mouth feel very nice but you remove the fat you remove those nice properties so we want to replace with something that has lower calorie than fat but still having the properties of fat it's not easy it's very challenging but uh, yes rice starch have been used for this purpose you know why because rice starch has very small granule so there's the small granule of rice starch actually simulate the creaminess the cream the cream the creamy property of fat that we have replaced so in a way it it will trick our tongue you know uh, our our tongue our sensory uh, or, uh, our sensory uh, our taste bud and and so on on the tongue when we eat something that uh, contain rice starch so we get that kind of uh, creaminess as as if that we have a lot of fat in the starch so rice starch because of the small granules simulate the creaminess of the fat and in fact there is uh, there are other uh, type of starch which have granules even smaller than rice starch smaller than 1 micron for example sorghum have you heard about sorghum s o r g h u m this is type of cereal also only grow in um, in arid dry uh, area like india africa and sorghum has a even smaller granule than rice so this type of starch is uh, has been used for as a fat replacer because they have they can simulate the creaminess of fat but the calorie is only half of fat uh, some type of starch has dual taburan size granule bimodal bimodal unimodal is just just like normal distribution one peak but dual taburan size means we have two peaks so meaning that we have say one group of granule have this size another group of granule have this average size so this the, what, what we meant by by model example like wheat wheat starch they have say around maybe 20 micron size another around 60 micron okay and barley and rye barley you know barley right it's a type of cereal also or what about rye also a type of cereal yeah what do you mean by amaran ah ah even smaller granule amaran is also a type of cereal now yeah this is what cause tengah granule form clusters so they are called they are known as compound granules um, some granule has protein on the surface the, the picture just now when we look at the picture we we don't we don't see the protein of course can we see the protein on the granule surface usually no but if we put dye pewarna um certain type of dye that can react with the protein and form color uh for example fuchsin f u f u s c h i n this is a special type of dye pewarna when we add to the starch it will react with the protein and it can form a, like a green color so when we look under the microscope you can see so actually for some type of starch on the surface of the granule there are some protein and inside the granule also sometimes we can find proteins 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 body so 
um, if we have grain, uh, protein on the surface of the granule, that also will, will affect or will influence the properties of the starch. The more protein that we have, the more it will influence the process of gelatinization and also the retrogradation as well as the textural properties, the mouthfeel of the starch as well. And in the starch also, we can find some lipids. We can find some lipids. Some starch has very little, some starch have more. Cereal starch, digerin, contain more lipids, contain more protein. Cassava, tuber starch, cassava, root starch, cassava, tuber starch such as potato, our sagu starch, our sagu, again. They contain very little lipid, very little protein. And therefore, we will find their properties will be different also. So maybe, hopefully, we can start to see now, um, when we learn about the functional properties of starch, especially gelatinization, very important, and retrogradation as well, there are many factors, actually, that will affect the, these two properties, gelatinization and retrogradation. The ratio of amylose and amylopectin, the size of the granule, the swelling property of the granule, the presence of other minor components, small components, protein, lipid, uh, even phosphorus, yeah? um, and also uh, the amount of damaged granule. During the uh, processing of starch, some starch will undergo wet extraction, yeah? like corn and so on, uh, cassava. Some starch will go under wet milling process. It will go through the milling, will be you know sheared. So during that process, the mechanical shear and so on uh, would would damage some of the granule. So you can see some truncated granule just now. So the granule will be you know sheared and exposed. So that is called damaged starch, and the amount of damaged starch is important because. Uh, for example, in wheat, in wheat starch, in wheat flour, the more damaged starch you have, and during uh, baking, during the process of bread making and so on, because we use yeast, so the enzyme will, will act on the damaged starch. Damaged starch will be hydrolyzed uh, easier because the granule has been exposed. Yeah, and and then these are the different properties of the starch granule in terms of size, in terms of shape. Okay, these are the physical properties of the granule. Now, when we look the starch, native starch under the granule, sorry, under the granule, under the microscope, um, this normal light microscope, this is the polarized microscope. So this is the real picture that from from our from our from my research. So you can see very nice Maltese cross. And the, the point here, the point here is called helium, yeah? Where is it? Somewhere here. It's called, yeah, here. Helium or hilum. And that is actually the point when, during the biosynthesis of starch, the, uh, the growth of the amylose and amylopectin chain, okay? And native starch, we can see the Maltese cross very clearly, but during gelatinization, and the presence of this Maltese cross is an indication of degree of order. So meaning that, uh, the, actually the amylopectin component in the granule form the semi-crystalline structure. The A branch of the granules form the crystalline structure. And when we, look, when we look under a special microscope, uh, this kind of picture we cannot see under light microscope, we cannot see under SEM, scanning electron microscope. We can only see this kind of microscope, this image under using CLSM. Who can, who can uh, expand this acronym, CLSM? Huh? 
้นขุนโฟกัลไลท์มิโครสโคปสเปเชียลไทป์ของมิโครสโคปและมันจะดูในกรานิวและเหมือนที่มันสามารถเห็นทั้งดิเมนชันของกรานิวในสองดิเมนชันนะครับเราสามารถเห็นที่นี่กรานิวทุกชนิดกรานิวของสตาร์ชกรานิวมีลักษณะนี้ก็เหมือนกับกระดูกทรงเวลาคุณตัดกระดูกคุณสามารถเห็นกระดูกเราเรียกว่ากระดูกที่แสดงอายุของกระดูกหนึ่งกระดูกหนึ่งปีใช่ Uh, but not here. Here we cannot say that one ring, one year. We will see in the next picture the structure, how the amylopectin is being arranged to form so-called a semi-crystalline structure. It's an alternate layer of crystalline, amorphous, crystalline, amorphous, crystalline, amorphous, like this. Okay, and it, this is uh, a. Another view of the granule. So this is using uh, using a TEM. 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 Anyway, we have to slice the granule. And the uh, technique is very tedious, very tedious. Yeah? It takes hours to really get a very thin layer until you can see this kind of structure under the microscope. We have to be really, really patient to use this kind of microscopy technique. We can do it here actually in biology, but uh, it's very tedious. But if you prepare the sample properly, this is what you will see. Okay. This is what we call growth ring, gelang tumbesaran. Okay, and this is how we translate the meaning of this growth ring. Actually, if we now magnify one one part of this into a bigger picture, so each ring that you see here. Is actually a crystalline face in the granule, and if we magnify this part, this is what you will see, which reminds us of what the amylopectin branch structure, the A chain, the B chain, the C chain. Remember the the clusters, each clusters of the of the chain. Of the uh, of the A chain will form this crystalline lamella, and the branch. This is the alpha one six branch. Branch will form the amorphous lamella. Okay, so we have a crystalline amorphous, crystalline amorphous, crystalline amorphous, and in between. So we have one one line of this. This is a crystalline. Then in between is the amorphous lamella, crystalline again, amorphous lamella again. And what is this? This blue area. That is where most of the amylos is residing. Is located. Okay. So now imagine in a native starch granule, the amylos and amylopectin actually they are sort of Intermingle, yeah, intermingle. You, we can only separate these two components when we gelatinize the starch. When the granule swell and finally burst, then only the amylose and amylopectin will be sort of separated. And there is a different view of how we can. Uh, How we can uh, understand the, the the growth ring structure in the granule. That's why we have to understand first the different model, and this model is based on the Hizukuri 
model of amylopectin. And we say that uh, starch has a semi semi crystalline structure, not not 100% crystalline. So the crystalline portion, the crystalline domain, or the crystalline phase in the granule is the amylopectin. Remember, and amorphous uh, amylose form the amorphous phase or amorphous domain. How much is the crystalline phase? Uh, on average, between 15 to 45 percent. Um, don't worry about this. When we look under, when we uh, radiate the X-ray on the native granule, we can we can get an X-ray pattern. So, because anything that X-ray is used to study crystal, okay. So we have Professor Fan in physics school, one of the top scientists in Malaysia. He studied the crystal structure. So how how to study crystal structure by using X-ray. So the same method we use to study the crystalline structure of starch. So by looking at the different pet X-ray pattern from different types of starch, we can classify or categorize starch into basically three main types based on the pattern. This is called A pattern, B pattern, and C pattern. Or A type starch, B type starch, C type starch. So if we say this starch is an A type, it just simply means it shows the A type pattern, A type X-ray pattern. Okay. There's another pattern called V. This pattern is not shown by native starch. It is shown by starch, gelatinized starch, after they form complex. The amylose, remember amylose has a helix structure. In the middle of that helix, it has a hydrophobic property. So it can form complex with um, uh, fatty acid or phospholipid. And that structure, when we look, uh, when we look at the pet X-ray pattern, it will give a different pattern. It's not an A pattern. It's not a B pattern. It's not a C pattern. And the scientists, for some reason, they don't call it D pattern. They want, they call it V pattern. Okay. Because by right, it's, if it's not A, if, if it's not B, it's not C, then we can we can call it D, right? But they call it V. Don't ask me why. I don't know. <laughs> and native starch can have B type, but retrograded starch after we cook the starch, that is nice. Cool it down, it will retrograde. The retrograded starch also show a B type. So, so that's how the X-ray pattern looks like. But of course, this is a very much simplified pattern. If you look at the original pattern, <coughs> it doesn't, I mean, it uh, looks more complicated, of course. This is a simplified. Um, sim when we look at the X-ray pattern, what do we look at? Just like when you look at the HPLC, if you have learned about HPLC, I think yes, because you have done an IMG203. What you look at the H uh, on the chromatogram, HPLC chromatogram? You look for what? Huh? Peak. You look for peak, right? Similarly, in X-ray, you also look for peak. Every crystal would have their own fingerprints. The fingerprints, of course, the peaks. The peaks would appear at a certain reflection angle. Uh, the unique. Every crystal will have its own unique pattern. So we can differentiate between this crystal, that crystal, and, and so on. And similarly, starch also will show these different peaks which appear at different two theta angle. So that's how we read the X-ray. So, well, of course, we don't have to know this pattern is at what angle, but we just look at the pattern roughly. That's how it looks like. A pattern, B pattern, C pattern. So what type of starch has an A pattern X-ray? 
most cereal we show most yeah not all most most uh, tuber like potato we show b and some tuber and some cereal we show c c is like a mix of mixture of a and b mixed together some uh, apa ni? Apa ni? A tuber or cereal? What about our sago? Our sago? A, B or C? Huh? I I leave it to you to find out. If you find the information, share. Okay? Of course, I can tell you now, but again. Yeah, remember, I want you to create your own knowledge. Okay. Eh, this one is the V pattern. It terbang from here. Okay. Anyway, don't don't worry so much about this. Um, I just put up this slide to show you, to give you some idea about the complexity of the crystal. Again, remember the nature is designed to capture that sunlight energy, turn that into storage carbohydrate in the form of starch. But again, it was designed in such a way that the amylopectin molecule is arranged in such a way to form a crystal. Crystal is always thermodynamically stable form. See? So there must be a reason why amylopectin is formed into a crystalline phase in order sort of to stabilize the energy in the storage form, in the tuber, in the cereal, and so on. But if you look at the structure of the crystal, this is very actually quite complicated or very complicated. Okay? Um, and uh, <clears throat> Actually, in between the crystal, we can have water molecules trapped within that structure. So I'm sure you know in chemistry, uh, you have a you have a crystal, say magnesium sulfate six hydrate with six amount six molecule of water, right? So there's some formula chemical compound with the in the hydrate form. Kan? Ada formula molecule dia yang depan dia. 5 H2O kan? Or 6 H2O Apa maksudnya tu? The meaning is that the, mean, the meaning of that It is a crystal With molecules of water Embedded Within that crystal Structure So the same here But anyway um, Don't worry so much about this But what we now more interested is to look at some of the other components in starch. When we process the starch, form it into powder or flour, it looks like dry powder, but it always contains some minimum amount of water, usually in the form of bound water. You have learned about water, free water, bound water, right? And on average, on average, always contain around 10 to 12 percent. Always there. Okay? So during storage, it's important to control the humidity so that the moisture in, in the flour would not increase. Because what happens if the moisture increase more than 12 percent? Imagine that uh, if you go to any flour mill, or maybe you have seen the movie, uh, you know, in, in America they have oh, very tall silos. They store the grain there, but after the grain has been processed into flour, the flour will also be there. We have another silo for the flour. Those who have gone training into the flour mill, who, who have gone, and so what is the? How do they control the moisture? In the flam, uh, sorry, in the in the silo. Oh, yeah, 
yeah, that's how they they want to sh make sure the flow con the the moisture content. But how do they control the RH and so on? Okay. 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 L l after the, the the grain has been processed into flour. They have one silo for the flour, right? So how do they control the moisture there? So that the moisture is always maintained around 12%, right? Okay, tak apalah. <laughs> lupa. But how do they control the RH there? They control the No, they have to control the RH of the silo also. But anyway, the point is this. The point is... The moisture must be maintained around 12 percent because if the moisture if the moisture increase, then you get all sort of problem, spoilage, and and so on. Okay, it's very important. Okay, but um, but um, just uh, yeah, these are the minor components. I want you to explore uh, and 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 understand what are the effects of this minor component on this uh, on the starch, yeah? lipid, and so on. Phosphorus. A lot of phosphorus present in uh, starch like potato. Yeah? Okay, our next lecture, we will talk about gelatinization. Okay? So let's us build our wall together and wish for the best. Wall wisher. Thank you.